Hello there and welcome to another Factorio Flavours video and this is the series where we take one of the more complicated concepts in Factorio, in this case how Arcospheres work, or rather how Arcospheres can be used, and then each of us will come up with a different design around how we're going to use these things and then I'll talk through them and show you the variety and the various differences and different possibilities that the, uh, that, that part of the game gives you. So let's start off with something fairly simple. This is how I did Arcospheres in my previous 0.5 run through. So over here we've, we've got a, a warehouse that takes all the way, all the Arcospheres in and we store a sort of our supply of Arcospheres in there. And then from here, whenever we need to make something from the Arcospheres, the, uh, the logistics box will grab them, they'll bring them over to the machines over here where they'll drop them off in the blue chests. And then as you can see over here we're making the four types of data cards required for Deep Space Science 3. Down here we're making one for Deep Space Science 4, we're making the Naquium Tesseract and we're making the Naquium Processors. So all the different bits and pieces you need are being brought in here. We're churning through it, and we're producing all those different things. Fine. Uh, so there's a few a few things wrong with this design, but that, which I'll get onto in a moment. But first, let's talk about how I'm how I'm organising the Arcospheres over here. Because when you use Arcospheres, each of the recipes will take in a number of Arcospheres. In this case, it takes in a Zeta and an Omega, and then it will produce either in for this particular recipe, it'll either produce two Lambdas or two Phi's. And so each one of the recipes over here has a different requirement. It'll take in certain types of Arcospheres and it'll kick other ones out. And you then need to do a certain amount of sorting of the Arcospheres after that and reprocessing them to get them back into the state they were in beforehand. And so in order to do that, and I go into a lot more detail about how this works in the Arcospheres tutorial video, which uses this very system, and I might need to make a new updated version of that one. But anyway, you have two types of uh, recipe. There's, there's these ones around the outside of here. There's eight different ones, which e each take in two Arcospheres. In this case, you take in a Xi and a Gamma, and it'll produce a Zeta and a Lambda. And there's eight different versions of those, which are called folding recipes. And then down here, there's two versions which we call, which are called inversion recipes, which take in four types of Arcosphere and output the other four. And there's various complicated ways that mean you can't, using these recipes, you can't get from any combination to any other combination. However, if you include these two as well, then you can go from absolutely any combination to any other combination. And so my way of deciding whether it's worth running these recipes or not is to look at the total number of Arcospheres that we have in the warehouse, and that's being pulled out on the red cable, as you can see here, goes from the warehouse, goes out to all of the different um, combinators around the edge that allow the machines to decide whether they should be run or not. And then we add up the number of the number of the input types. So in this particular case, we're taking in Xi's and Zetas and producing Thetas and Phi's. So over here, we're looking for the number of Xi's and we're subtracting the number of Thetas. So that's looking at one of the inputs and subtracting one of the outputs. And then the other one is taking the number of the other input and subtracting the number of the other output. And then both of those are being output as S's, which are being put onto the same signal. And that means that if we get a positive number on this S signal, it means there are more of the input type than there are of the output type. If we get a negative number, it means there's more of the output type than there are of the input type. Now if we have more of the input type than the output type, then by running it we can get ourselves closer to balance. And so we have an inserter over here that's on the same cable and that's watching for when S is greater than 2. If S is greater than 2, it'll pass the arcospheres over into this machine and it will run and it will, sort, it, will, it will fold them and we'll get slightly closer to balance. Exactly the same is true for the other seven machines around here, and then a similar thing for these two down here, except that we're watching all four of them here, and we're adding, we're running them all, and then over here we're using, we're watching if, if it's less than minus four for that one, or if it's greater than four for this one. So if it's further out of balance, if it's four out of balance, then we'll run the appropriate inversion recipe, and, and then churn through and drop them back onto the belt here, they'll go back into the, into the warehouse. And so the idea is that this should keep this system more or less in balance. And if we look at the number that's on there in total, you can see that it's 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 okay. We've got between one and well, right now two, two and six, one and six. Those sort of um, quantities of, of each of the arcospheres. We've got some of all of them, which means the whole system is able to run. And it's not too out of balance. And the machines and the machines over here are folding to try and keep it reasonably balanced. If I take out this um, RoboPort down here and let all the arcospheres come flowing back in, then that will try and get us a bit more into into balance. You can see. As the machines are still running, in fact there's still more arcospheres being passed through, and you can see that the numbers are getting now really, really quite close. So now that we've stopped taking the arcospheres out to put them into all of the other recipes that are churning through them, we've now got between 9 and 12 of them, so it's closer to balance. So you can see that if you leave the system alone, it will eventually get back into balance. Now this is no use for keeping the system running. Let's put the, uh, the, the, the uh, roboport back in and give it its robots back. And it can now start sort of taking all the, all the arcospheres out to where they're required and running the system. Now there are a few problems with this system. So the first one is that it uses logistics bots, and I don't really like using logistics bots if I can avoid it, because for this sort of thing, it was the best way I could come up with at the time, because I didn't want to have 
a, no, a large number of belts coming out of here with huge numbers of Arcospheres stuck on them because Arcospheres are expensive. You never have all that many of them. It's not like Naquium plates or, or memory cards where you can just fill the belt up with it like this. I wanted to have a system where they'd only be taken out on demand. And so it sort of works for that. But the problem is that it also means you end up with a number of them stockpiled in each of these in each of these chests. So you can see over here, there's two stuck in here. And then over here, you end up with all these machines end up with a couple of arcsphere stuck in each one when they're not doing the recipes. You can see here we've got one gamma in this machine that was passed over, um, but but then it got it back into into alignment before we put the Xi in, so it hasn't run with that one. Over here we've got two Xi's in this one. And so you you lose one or two arcospheres into each one of these machines. You could potentially lose some into these ones down here as well. It's just, it just means that there's a few arcospheres stuck in places and they're a little bit wasted. So that's not ideal, but it's, it's not the end of the world. Um, but yeah, I'd, I'd rather it wasn't doing that. Other than those problems, I'm pretty happy with this system. It's, uh, it, it works very nicely. You need to put in maybe 100 Arcospheres to get it working reliably, and I haven't put in some of the more advanced cards on here because it was just a quick throw together of the previous design I was using. But the whole system is generally, it works quite nicely. But then when we started putting this Flavors video together, I thought, you know, I could make this better. What if, instead of having a warehouse in the middle, I replaced the warehouse with a belt? And that belt could then go out to all the machines around the edge here. And you see, see, we've got all the same machines over here using the Arcospheres and the same ones over here being um, taking them in. And then I thought, yes, this is all very well. And, this, and having it set up like this makes it nice and obvious how the system works. You've got the folders over here and the inverters. And then you've got the machines over here that will actually use everything. And yeah, that's a nice idea, except that none of it seems to be working. I'm not sure why not. I'm not going to worry about that too much because I then thought, why not actually cram the whole thing a bit closer together? Because if you've just got this single belt going around the outside here and you've made it as short as possible, cramming the machines in as close as you can, then it's going to take a lot less time for an Arcosphere to get from one place where it's dropped off to another place where it's needed. And so this is now, um, I think, this is this is the best version of this system, of this basic idea that I've been able to come up with. And so around here, it's working in exactly the same way. You've got for all your folding machines, and I put most of the folders in the middle, and then there's two more on the edge over here because that's where they fitted. For all of them, I've got the sa exactly the same sort of process set up. So I've got two combinators set up here that in this case are watching for the, the omegas and the xi's, lambdas and thetas, doing the maths on them as before, and then passing a signal down to this uh, uh, inserter down here, and this one triggers in exactly the same way. When you see greater than two, it'll, it'll put the, uh, the arc spheres into here and the machine will run. Got all the same all the same system on all of these all of these machines around the outside here and it's working in exactly the same way. It's just all crammed in a bit closer together. However, there are a couple of major differences. Because I've got a, a looped belt around here, we're keeping them on the belt instead of in a warehouse, I don't have an easy way to get the signal off here and, and read it and find out where all of my arcospheres are. Now there are a couple of ways to read the signals off of a belt. You can go on along it and link the belt up all the way along and have and, and then read the signal off there and, and use that to analyze what's on there. However, there is a cleverer way to do it, and I have uh, Mark to thank for this idea, or at least for the imp this in particular implementation of this idea, because he's done this in our uh, K2SE run for uh, for one of the logistics systems, it's not for the Arcosphere processing. But the way this works is that for every every um, inserter that's running on the on the system here, we have we have it linked up to the circuit network system. And so you can see around here, this one is there's a there's a green cable that runs all the way around here, going to lots and lots of these inserters. And so we're watching that one. In this particular case, this is reading, reading the hand contents as a pulse whenever it takes something out and puts it onto the belt, specifically when it puts it onto the belt. This one is taking things off the belt, so that's linked up to the red network. And that also does a read hand contents and a pulse whenever it, whenever it picks something up off the belt and puts it into here. And th those numbers are then fed around to these two combinators over here. So the first one uh, multiplies everything that's passed into, into it by minus one, so negating it, and the other one goes straight into this combinator. The number from this, from the, uh, the the maths being done on here, goes into this combinator as well. And this is set up as a memory cell. So we've got the the input, as you can see here, the input is fed into the output. So the number is the number that's output on here is immediately sent back to the beginner input and fed back through. So it, it will remember that number. But we're also feeding in the numbers from these inserters. So every time an arcosphere is put onto the belt, it's added onto the number that's being remembered here. And every time one is taken off, it's being subtracted from it because it goes through this negating combinator first. And so this keeps track of it. You can see the input signals over there. Those look a lot like the signals we were seeing on the other system where we were reading out of the warehouse. And you can see it's trying to keep it in balance. It's struggling a little bit, but we've got at least we've got some of all of, well, we did have some of all of the arcospheres. It, it, it's flicking in and out. It's, it's struggling a little bit, as I say. Um, but in theory, the idea of this is it, it will then be able to keep everything in balance because we're using the, the, the system in exactly the same way. And so when one of these machines should be running, its light will come on like that or like that one. 
and then as it as it uh, loads the arc spheres in, it'll start running, and then it'll unload them onto the onto the belt, and hopefully keep the system more or less in balance. Now I could shove some more arc spheres into the system. So if I would go down to this one, this this chest down here, this is linked into the green green cables down here. So any arc spheres that come out of here onto the system will be added onto it. So I could put in a, a few of these um, extra arc spheres like this, fill the system up a little bit more, and as they're passed out, we'll see the numbers will go up over here, and we'll get we'll have more of each of the arc spheres on the belt. And so we'll now need to do a little bit more uh, chugging through to try and sort them and get them get everything balanced. We're getting closer to having a nice number of all of the arc spheres available all the time. So I think that's pretty much everything there is to say about this system. It still has the same problem that the previous one did, where sometimes you'll end up with a couple of arcospheres being stockpiled in these machines, but it's not using any logistics bots, and the system doesn't have to, you don't have to rely on waiting for the dump belt to drop them back onto the system. So this this is I feel this is much neater. It's much I feel it's cleverer as well, and that gets a lot of points in my head for, uh, for uh, on, on that point. But it works in very much the same system. We've still got the inverters over here, the folders in the middle, then the machines across the top here making the uh, cards for Deep Space Science 3, We've got one down here making for Deep Space Science 4, We've got across here for Advanced Science 2, which we didn't see on the previous design, I've finished this one off, and then along here we've got the processors and the tesseracts. So I think that's everything you could possibly want to make from Naquium Cubes, although it is possible I've forgotten something. But if, I'm, I'm quite pleased with the way this all fits in quite neatly around the outside of the side of this belt. With this design, there isn't room for any more systems around it. I, I wouldn't be able to squeeze another one in even if I wanted it. Without doing a major redesign, probably making the loop of belt a little bit bigger. But, I'm, as I say, I'm pleased with this design. I think this is the, uh, the natural sort of end point of this system. I could, if I wanted to, make it all run a little bit faster by putting some speed modules in these two beacons on either side. As it is, I feel like everything's running quite nicely, quite smoothly. I don't feel it needs extra speed. And if we look over here, it's, well, it's actually still a little bit out of, out of alignment, but I don't know if there's much we can do about that. Let's try chucking some speed modules in these machines. Now everything is running a bit faster. We've got a few, as you can see, we've got a few of the uh, folders in the middle right, still running. I don't think that's really made a great deal of difference. You can see we're, we're maybe slightly closer to being in balance, but it does mean. But you can tell that all of the all the machines are running nearly all of the time, and so I think this is pretty. This is a pretty good design. The next one we're going to take a look at is down here. This is Mike's system, which if you've been watching the uh, K2SE playthrough will look very, very familiar to you because this is copied and pasted basically straight out of the game we're playing. Uh, I've done a little bit of tidying up because I'm using things like Infinity Chest to produce all the resources it needs. Uh, so we've got rid of a little bit of the Tangle of Spaghetti, but basically it's running, it's exactly the same system and it's, uh, it's running in, in the same way. So there are a number of similarities in the system to, the, to what we've been doing elsewhere. Again, you've got the belts running around here with their, their contents being red and a warehouse over here for, for stockpiling. Um, and so that's keeping the, keeping us with a, a running total, so we know how many um, arcospheres there are everywhere, and it's doing it through the, the belt reading method. But instead of comparing inputs and outputs for each particular recipe and going, will this res will running this recipe bring me closer to balance? Mike has approached it in a slightly different direct from a slightly different point of view um, for that. And over here, he's done what he describes as a lowness detector. So over here, he's used this combinator here to set what he reckons to be a, a, a level that he doesn't want it to dip below. So he's got ten. He's decided ten percent of each arcosphere is a good is a good aim number to aim for, and that makes sense because because you've got eight different types of arcospheres. So if you reckon you don't want it to go below ten percent of any one particular type, then that gives you a little bit of buffer to play around in, and you're not trying to swap things over all the time trying to achieve perfection. But if they drop down a little bit too low, then you can give it a churn and try and get the right things back again. So up up here, he's converting the uh, the number of arcospheres into a percentage by looking at the total number of absolutely everything and then dividing each arcosphere by multiplying each arcosphere total by 100 and then dividing it by the, the total number of arcospheres so he's got percentages coming out and then over here he's, he's uh, checking the each arcosphere type against its percentage so at the moment for example he's getting in eight nine percent of the size coming in um, and then and uh, because that's less than ten percent he's outputting one psi down here for example the epsilons are at about 18 19 percent and so that is significantly more than the ten percent he's watching for so this one isn't outputting an epsilon and we then know that there are two recipes that can make xi's. One takes in a lambda and an omega, the other takes in a phi and a gamma. And so he's looking at the number of each of those and then deciding which of those is the better one to run based on which one there's more of. So over here he's, he's, looking, he's counting up the number of, he's adding up the two inputs and adding up the two of the other inputs, outputting them as a one and a seven. So if one is greater than seven, then it outputs a one. If seven is greater than or equal to one, it outputs a seven. So he'll, along here we'll get the output of the, whichever one there's more of, so in this case it's seven. Seven is the better one to run, that's passed over to here. And that tells, system number seven over here that this is the one that's to be run. 
Now, instead, once again, instead of doing things the way I've done it, which is to put filters on or to control the inserters that are loading the arcs into the machine, instead he's gone up here where he's got uh, the the inserters along here are watching for a number seven. And because seven is the one that takes phi's and gammas over here, if he sees a seven, it will output a phi. Sees in here, if it sees a seven, it will output a gamma. And so those will be put onto this belt. They'll roll round down to here. They'll be grabbed by these inserters, put into the machine. It'll churn through them, and it'll output the other the uh, whatever it is it outputs, the omegas and the zeis, and those will get passed up and go back into the system. Up here. The reason Mike has set it up like this is to prevent arcospheres getting stuck in the inputs of the folding machines. As long as there's sufficient supply in the warehouse, exactly the right number of spheres will be passed out of the warehouse when the instruction is sent, and those will be loaded into the machine. Whereas with my design, you'll typically end up with an extra one of the inputs, which takes an arcosphere out of circulation. Now personally, I don't think the system is as good as the one I put together. I think the I think the lowness detector is an overly complicated way of working it out. That said, I'm aware that I probably have a certain amount of bias towards my own design, so I'm not going to I'm not going to criticize it and say it's bad. I'm just going to say it feels different to the way I'd have done it. There is also a th bit of a throughput problem up here, but that has been fixed in the current uh, state of the, uh, the state of the art for this machine. I've not copied the latest version of this over because it, the, the, it's not had any major cha conceptual changes. It's just been improved a little bit. So we've got faster belts, we've got faster inserters, and two of them putting more of the more of the arcospheres out onto the belt over here. But at the moment, you can see this system. This system is working. So we've got the lowness detector down here. We'll say, okay, we've, we've got a shortage of one particular type of arcosphere. What's the best way to make that based on which what's which one's got most inputs available? And then it tells it to run that system, that recipe over here. We've got the same same sort of thing happening for the inversion recipes. Those are all run, those keep the system in balance, and then we have over here, we have a clock that runs through all the different types of arcospheres in turn and passes those over to the filter on this um, on this inserter. So you can see the filter changing very, very quickly over here. And each time this pings, it will in theory it will unload one type of arcosphere from here onto the belt. And the, in theory that means that we will have a steady stream of all the different types of arcospheres coming through in turn, one at a, one at a time, and those can be fed into the machines, they will run through them and then pass it off and uh, and we can then do do the sciences, do the do the tesseracts and so on from here, and we'll get all of, in theory, get all of the outputs we could possibly want. Here we can see Mark's first design from when he first played through uh, Space Exploration 0.5. And as you can tell, this is somewhat more complex than uh, than a lot of the other systems we've been looking at, and has a lot of combinators over here. Uh, and he's been kind enough to leave some to leave some uh, notes down here as to how the system works, so that I can sound like I know what I'm talking about when I tell you how it works. Once again, he's got all the machines along here, all the grab facilities that are doing all the different folding recipes, and then two of each of the inversion recipes at the bottom to make sure he's got enough throughput on those. And unlike the other systems we've looked at, this one actually chooses which of the recipes is the best one to run at any given time, and will run that specific recipe. And the way it does that starts off fairly similar to the other way ways we've seen. So over here, we're looking at the various different arcospheres that are involved in this particular recipe. And so he knows that if he runs this one, then he'll have one fewer lambda, one fewer omega, one additional xi, and one additional theta. So he's adding one to these numbers and subtracting one from these, these over here. And then he's using those numbers to analyze how much closer that would get him to being properly balanced. The system then compares all of the different choices that it could make and decides which of those would bring it closest to balance, so the one that would make the biggest improvement, and then it runs that particular recipe. So, so rather than just looking at it simply and saying, will this make things better, like mine does, or looking at it and saying, well, we need more of this one, what's the, uh, the best way to make those, like Mike's doing, this system will analyse all the different possible recipes it could run and then decide which of those is the best one. He's also got a pretty graph over at the side here that shows how many of each of the different arcosphere types he's got in, in, in the system. As you can clearly see, this system is built around logistics bots, so he's got the bots taking the, uh, the, the arcospheres from the chests over here to wherever they're needed and then bringing them back over again. So all of these are filtered, um, filtered storage chests, so you can see it down there, it's set to only hold, hold the right type of arcosphere. And then when he's got a decent number of them, they'll be brought up here by, these, by the bots to these chests up here. Uh, and then we can feed them through into this system, system up here. And the intention is to bring arcospheres over to here whenever there's more than a certain number of them available down here. So in theory, you'll only bring over ones that aren't needed to keep the folding in balance. And then from there, once a recipe is run, the, the uh, used arcospheres will be taken out of the chests and brought back over to this blue chest here, which will pass them through between the two separate logistics networks. So he's got, as you can see here, two separate logistics networks, one for all of the, uh, the folding and the inverting down here, and then a second one up at the top, which manages bringing the arcospheres to from the uh, production systems up here. Now that the system is running, you can see it down here we have, okay, I, th I think the, the, the system overall needs a few more arcospheres put into it, so I'll, I'll make a few more. And there we go, now the bots are starting to bring them over over here. We've got a decent supply of most of the spheres available over here. They're, the uh, the, the um, 
all the construction recipes are running quite happily, and the uh, used ones are being passed back over to be to be refolded back into the system. And you can see from over here from the graph that the balance isn't quite right. However, the system is working quite hard to try and bring it everything back into balance. And I'm sure as it runs, it'll it'll pull it back in closer and closer, and we'll, we should have a decent supply of everything available. And eventually, we'll be able to bring enough spheres over here to keep everything running and keep everything satisfied. The next one I want to look at is Tristan's build from uh, 0.5, and it's. Well, it, it shares some similarities. I believe he's using a fairly similar logic to decide whether to fold the uh, whether to run the folding recipes or not. So along here, we've got um, we're counting the number of outputs and the number of inputs uh, as A's and O's. So here you can see epsilons and omegas going in. So that's epsilon and omega are being put added together as A's. Then we, we've got gammas and lambdas are coming out. So we've got gammas and lambdas as O's. He's then subtracting one from the other here as D. And if if presumably along here, yes, and if difference is greater than ten, then he's going to run it. So he's he's, got, he's picked. Some slightly higher numbers than I have, but it's basically it's the same system just with a few more combinators. The difference over here, apart from the, the sheer scale of it, is that he's got he's got a system to make sure he never runs out of certain types of arcospheres. And so down the middle here he's got a row of warehouses and these store spare arcospheres, should we say. These are the ones that are available to be used up here in the buildings or in the construction systems. But also, they're set to monitor the number of arcospheres in, in the belt, on the belt around the outside. And you can see he's done this the other way. He's got the belt being read all the way around. So he's got read belt contents as a whole. So he always knows the total of everything that's on the, in, in his system, looking from, the, from all of these belts. And he's watching to see whether that's greater than 10 of any particular arcosphere. And if it gets over 10, you can see over here for this example, this is the, for the theta arcospheres, he's watching here to see if theta is greater than t, where t is his number, and in this case it's 10. If there's more than 10 theta arcospheres on the belt running around the outside, then this will kick in and it will pass through theta arcospheres into this warehouse. And on the opposite side, we're saying if it's less than T, then it'll pass them back out again. So the idea is that there should always be 10 of each type of arcosphere on the belt running around the outside here. And that's available for all the folding machines and the inversion machines to use to make sure that we, he never runs out. And, if, and then if there's any spares beyond that, they can then be put into the warehouses. And he's then got, as you can see over here, the, the uh, logistics bots taking them away from there, putting them into the chests over here. They can be put into the machines here to, do the, to run the recipes to make the data cards that are required. And then once they're used, used up, they'll be put out into this purple chest here, which will take them over to dump them into a blue chest down here that I think is requesting absolutely everything. Yes, here we go. Now, I think he's missed a slight uh, trick here. He could have had them go being put back into the green warehouses in the middle, but then I suppose there's a slight risk then of him running out, because if they get grabbed out of these green warehouses before they've had a chance to be dumped out onto the belts, you might run out of some of the types and therefore not be able to do some of the folds or inversions. So he's being very, very careful to make sure he doesn't what, doesn't run out of anything. I was a bit more cavalier about that. I just thought, well, we'll have we'll make sure there's enough arcsophys in there. It'll probably be fine. And it turned out it was, but Tristan has gone for a slightly safer alternative by making sure that there's always a supply of them on the belt around the outside for the uh, for the folders and the inverters to use. He's also got a uh, pretty little graph over here which I have to admit I don't entirely understand. The numbers seem to surge up and down wildly and out of control and have very little to do with what's going on in this. I, I, I'm, I'm honestly not quite sure. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't think he's sure either because he designed the system a couple of years ago and it hasn't really touched it since. Tristan hasn't built an improved version of this system, um, he's instead done something completely different and because it's so different to everything else that we've seen, I'm going to show you that at the end because it is, well, it's, it's something that's worth waiting for, let me tell you that. The next one we're going to look at is Mark's updated design that he made for this video. And as you can see, it has a number of similarities to some of the earlier belt-based ones we've been looking at. Like my final system, it uses a memory cell over here to watch the uh, watch what's being fed out onto the belt and what's being fed and what's being fed back in again. In the same way I did, he's using the red cables to measure what's been taken off. So you can see here again we've got the read hand contents as a pulse, and the green cable to measure what's being put back onto the belts. And then all the numbers are being fed back over here to this one, which is being a memory cell. And you can see over there on the right hand side, and the what we believe we currently have in stock. And this appears to just include what's on the belts. It doesn't include what's in the warehouse. Um, the warehouse is not linked up to the system. So this is this could just be replaced with the loop back belt that goes around here. And you could probably then remove this reader here and this reader here, and just assume you've got the right number on the belt. So this is probably just for the input which was being fed in through here and this warehouse also allows you to have a bit of a buffer if you have rather more arcospheres than you expect to. I think we discovered that if you get up to 1600 arcospheres in total then this system jams completely well but if you have 1600 arcospheres then well you've been spending far too much time going off and getting them. <laughs> Then up here you have a very familiar system where you're adding together the inputs and adding together the outputs. So we know that at the moment, for example, we've got 20-ish uh, um, of the inputs type of um, arcosphere, and over here we've got about 18, 16, 14 of the output type of arcosphere. 
That's then being passed up to here, where he's subtracting the difference number that he wants to have, which is over here, the combinated D sends that over here, um, and that's currently 3. So he's subtracting the, that number from the input and, and outputting it as a new input. And then here he's comparing the inputs and outputs, and if the input after having subtracted the D is greater than the output, then he'll output that type of arcosphere um, down here. And those, those get fed down here and set as filters on this filter inserter. So instead of having a permanently set filter, and inserting the uh, the spheres when it, when it needs to run, he's turning the filters on and off on the, on the inserter, which is a different way of doing things. It's functionally going to be exactly the same, but it's interesting that he's done it in a it approached it in a different way. I'm also entertained that I seem to be the only one who's thought of subtracting the output arcospheres from the input arcospheres and then adding the two signals together, rather than creating an input signal and an output signal and subtracting one of those from the other. But you know, again, functionally it's very very similar. It just saves the odd arcosphere here and there. Mark has also done the converting of these numbers into negative numbers down here directly on the output, um, each one separately and then passing them out on the green signal rather than having separate input and output signals running around. But again, it doesn't make any difference functionally, it's just slightly less efficient with, with uh, combinators. I think that's everything there is to say about this design. Uh, once again, you've got all the folders along here. You've got, he's got two copies of each inversion recipe up here and I think Tristan's design had, had that as well um, because, sometimes, because the inversion recipes are a bit slower, I think. So sometimes you might need to run both of them to, to, keep, to help it keep up. And then across the bottom down here, you've got all the things where, where you're making various outputs, so all of the data cards across here and the, and the test racks and the processors. And everything is being heavily speed module just to keep it running at a nice speed as well. And so these systems, they're, yeah, they're all quite similar. You've got the same basic ideas running for, uh, for all of them, but they're all slightly different implementations, and I find that quite interesting. The final system I want to look at is the most crazy and ridiculous. I've, le I've, I've left the, uh, the most bizarre and most over the top for last. And this is Tristan's new system, so it's a complete rethink of all of the, all of the um, designs that we've been looking at before. And Tristan's approach for this system was to go, well, so you've got these recipes that take arcospheres in and do something with them and spit out different types of arcospheres. Okay, and we've got various recipes that will turn that, that will re refold those arcospheres into other ones that are potentially useful. What if we analysed those recipes and worked out which folds and inversions you had to run in order to return back to where you started from? And therefore you could use the same arcospheres and have an entirely deterministic system. So rather than rather than reading a circuit and going, okay, we've got a shortage of this one, or we've got too many of this one, let's run the folding recipes like this to, uh, to get them slightly closer to normal. What if instead for each recipe, you said, okay, so I've run this recipe once, it's output these arc spheres. So if I do this fold, this fold, this fold, and this inversion, then it'll get me back to where I started, and we don't need to do any measuring, anything like that. And we can run through, and we can just run the system over here. So what we've got here is we've got uh, this this machine down here is, for example, producing the um, the time space manipulation data. When it finishes running, it passes some arcospheres out that come up here. They'll be passed through this um, all of these. Uh, splitters and things over here and I'm sure there's very good reasons for why all of these are, are set up the way they are and I'm not going to go into any detail on this because whilst I understand the concepts I wouldn't want to go into the details of it because my head would melt. Uh, and so the idea is that if you run all of these in the right sort of orders and then in the right quantities then you'll get back the same things you started with and they'll run around here. The deep space belts are actually only required for the initial setup of the system. So I could go around this whole system and remove all of the deep space belts and superior inserters and they'll give us a slightly clearer view of it. So let's do that. If I drag this across here, then we'll get rid of all of that stuff. There we go. So this is now, now you can see the actual important parts of the system. And he's essentially used the, uh, all these filter splitters around here to make sure the correct arcospheres go to the right places and you always end up with exactly the right things in exactly the right places. And this was made a little bit more complicated because every one of these arcosphere recipes has two possible recipes and it randomly switches between them as it's running. You can see over there the types of arcospheres being output by this are different between the two recipes and it will change randomly between those two. So you can't really assume anything about it and so he's had to be really quite clever about the whole system in order to make sure that, that it will work in, 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 uh, on every single recipe because he's got two machines down here that are required to do one type of recipe and then a different one up here that is required for the other one and so he set that up by saying that he wants the uh, he just wants the uh, gammas to be sent out that way and then any and then only phi's down this way and uh, xi's down this way. And so with that, he can control where the, where the different arcospheres go and make sure they get properly folded to get back into the ones they're supposed to be. 
Up here, it's slightly more complicated, but it's um, yeah, you've got but he's got the, again the row of Arcosphere folding machines along here, just to make sure everything gets end, ends up the way, where it should be. And so he's done this for every single recipe. Yes, some are, some are more complicated than others. Some were some were pretty horrendous. This is the Tesseract that looks pretty awful. I imagine the uh, Naquin processors is going to be pretty bad as well. But you can see how we've got all the for each one of these, he's got a different setup and a different array of machines down here. And here we go. Here's another good, good example of where he's got two different output paths depending on what happens and which which recipe gets run. You can either pass the spheres around the top way or around the bottom way, and it'll run different machines depending on the different on the, for the different spheres. And so in order to do the analysis behind this, he's created a spreadsheet, which I'm not going to um, run run through with you because I don't understand it myself, but it's given him a way to analyze which recipes are required to sort out which Arcospheres. Uh, this system is... I'm, I'm, I have to say, I'm completely uh, gobsmacked by this entire system. It is, it is ridiculous and over the top, but I'm very, very impressed with them for coming up with it. Especially some of the more ridiculously complicated bits down here. Because not only is it working out which recipes you need to run in, in which order in order to get it back there, he's also not, not used any circuit conditions for it. Uh, he's just got it passing everything around and using the logic of these, of, the, of these splitters and things in order to make sure everything ends up in the right places. So, yeah, hats off to him. This is an incredible system. And... Um, I'm very impressed and have no desire whatsoever to try and implement this in a game myself. But it's one of those things that it's really nice to know that it's out there. So I shall, um, as usual, I shall make the uh, blueprints for all of these, uh, all these different systems, or at least the uh, the finished ones for each one, um, available as for for supporters on the Discord. So if you're a uh, if you're a Twitch subscriber, a YouTube member, or a Ko-Fi donator, make sure you're um, make sure you've, you've picked up your support status. You're on the Discord. You can have a look on there and um, and have have a play with these for yourself if you want to. Have you come up with an Arcosphere system that is like like any of these, or completely different from any of these? Anything you'd like to show off? Let me know in the comments, and I'd be I'd be interested to see any 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 uh, new variations on on the system, especially if you've done something completely different from anything we've done here. I was going to say I can only, I couldn't see any other sort of, any any other different ways to set up the logic for it, uh, and then Mike came up with a different way of doing it in, a, in our space exploration playthrough with his, by, by looking for which ones are running a bit low rather than comparing the, comparing the, for the recipe, and then Tristan came out with a completely new system over here that just, is, is just so completely different from everything else we've seen, and they're all so completely separate as well. I, I, I'm just, yeah, as I say, just still very impressed with this whole system here. Uh, but if you've done something different, I would, I'd love to see it. Let me know, uh, as I say, let me know in the comments and tell me what you, what, how you've done it differently. And if there's any other uh, systems in, in uh, Factoria, particularly if it's space exploration, because that's what we're playing at the moment and therefore is very fresh in our minds. If there's anything else you think we should uh, make another Flavors video about, I'd be in interested to hear about it. So we've already done, I think we've done Covarex and we've done Vulcanite processing. Because there's a, a few different way, things you can do in there and various different ways you can implement the various ideas. I think the Covarex one was the one where we went the most overboard, but the Vulcanite one was a nice way to, a, a nice starting point, I think. So yeah, always in, open for new ideas for videos and, um, and so make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss out on any of the future stuff we come up with. Uh, thank you very much for watching and I'll see you next time. Bye bye.